So hello everybody and welcome along to this PCR webinar entitled How Should I Treat Bicuspid Aortic Stenosis with TAVI? My name is Darren Milet. I'm an interventional cardiologist in Galway University Hospital in Ireland um, and I'm uh, very happy to, uh, to welcome you along for this uh, really exciting session. Uh, I'm joined today by a fantastic faculty uh, we have Dr. Chiari Dibas, uh, who is currently working in, uh, in Naples, uh, but tells me she's uh, planning to visit Toulouse again very soon. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Didier Teche, who needs no introduction. Um, Didier, welcome. Uh, and of course, we have uh, Didier's long-suffering partner, uh, Nicolas Dumontel, uh, again from Toulouse. So welcome, uh, Nicolas, and thank you for joining us. Um, the objectives of this session today um, are, are really very clear. Um, we would like to, to review aortic uh, uh, bicuspid aortic valve morphology um, uh, and, to, um, uh, and to really dive into pre-procedural planning uh, and challenges of TAVI, uh, in particular in bicuspid aortic valve disease. Uh, we would like to discuss the available evidence for TAVI in bicuspid aortic valve disease, or indeed, uh, uh, the lack of evidence, certainly with respect to randomized controlled trials and surgery. And we would also like to outline the steps uh, of how to treat bicuspid aortic valve disease with the Evolute Pro platform. Um, this session uh, is sponsored by Medtronic. Um, to give you a, a lie of the land, the plan uh, today is, is, to, uh, is to listen to a case presentation this was a, 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 a live recorded case done by Didier and, and Nicolas in Toulouse uh, just over a week ago, I believe. Um, we're then going to discuss the case and we would really love if, uh, if you would submit to us uh, your questions in relation to the indication for this case, the performance of this case, um, and then we're going to discuss those things together and then we can watch the, the 30 minutes of the case execution from, from Didier and Nicolas uh, in the hybrid lab in, uh, in, in Clinique Pasteur. Thereafter, uh, when we've seen the, the, the finish of the case, uh, we have a few topics that we think are important to discuss. Sizing in bicuspid aortic valve is always important and maybe give you a, a, a refresher on that. Uh, we're going to run through the key procedural steps as, as, as we see them in bicuspid patients. Chiara is gonna run through the available evidence for TABI in bicuspid. And then DDA is going to tackle the question of, do we need a randomized control trial um, for TAVI versus SAVR uh, in patients with bicuspid aortic valve disease? Um, so without further ado, I think we should get on and maybe DDA, uh, you might uh, introduce to us uh, uh, the case um, uh, from, from Toulouse that we're, going to be, uh, that we're going to be seeing. It's my great pleasure, Darren. So... Um... So we're going to see uh, through the next uh, slide that uh, this is uh, a bicuspid patient. And as uh, Darren, you just mentioned, we just have treated this patient uh, one week ago. And uh, uh, so it's going to be interesting to see afterwards uh, what is the outcome uh, for the patient. So, so let's start with the case uh, presentation. So as you're going to, you're going to see on the next uh, slide. So this was an 81 years old uh, gentleman uh, who uh, was referred to our institution for a shortness of breath, uh, progressive worsening, and it, uh, it didn't experience a, a recent uh, acute pulmonary edema, but it was, he was uh, extremely symptomatic. So you can see the, uh, the past history of the patient. This patient wasn't, uh, was a, a kind of slightly overweight, but not too much. Uh, hypertensive, and he had a prior story of a stroke without any sequelae. Next slide. Uh, so, uh, two months before the, uh, ad, uh, the ESA's mission to our hospital, he had an acute pulmonary edema without any recurrence, but he was uh, still symptomatic with an NYHA class 3 uh, diaspnenia. Uh, so, the uh, early initial uh, evolution uh, story was uh, favorable uh, with diuretics. And um, when we assessed this patient uh, concerning the uh, baseline potential conduction disturbances, the ECG was in sinus rhythm, but there was only uh, uh, stigmas of uh, left ventricle uh, hypertrophy. 
So on the laboratory investigation, uh, noticeable is the high, very high pro anti pro BNP level, uh, more than 4,000 picograms per milliliters. And you can see that the overall, the uh, creatinine uh, clearance and the renal function was uh, normal. So this is a uh, uh, quite important, uh, of major importance when it comes to the assessment of the uh, risk profile of the patient, uh, understanding what are the uh, echo uh, parameters, and we could uh, identify a preserved left ventricular ejection fraction. Uh, the left ventricular uh, diameters were uh, okay with the LVEDD of 54 uh, millim millimeters. The uh, assessment of the arctic valve confirmed the severity of the RX stenosis with an area of 0.5 cm square, a peak velocity well above 4 meters per second, and a mean gradient of 47 millimeters of mercury. Uh, the systolic pulmonary arterial pressure for this uh, gentleman was uh, quite in the normal range uh, concerning his age. So on the uh, coronary angiogram that we, we do for any kind of uh, uh, RX stenosis patient, there wasn't any major uh, coronary disease, some kind of mild atheroma at the level of the uh, uh, mid and distal LAD, but nothing significant. So a risk score assessment for this patient, um, uh, apart from the previous stroke, no major uh, clinical history. So the risk scores were quite low, even a logistic real score of 6.2%, uh, Euro score two of 1.4% and the STS score 1.9% for mortality. So when it comes only about um, estimation of the surgical risk, the, these were quite low, uh, but this was a 81 years old gentleman with a past history of stroke. Uh, slightly overweight. So after heart team assessment, as we do for any kind of RX stenosis patient, we decided to undergo, uh, to offer a TAVI for this patient. So when then we did the uh, CT assessment. And so on the CT assessment, uh, uh, as we all uh, do in our routine practice, we start with the uh, uh, measurements dimensions of the annulus. And here you can see that the annulus, the perimeter derived diameter was about 26 millimeter. And it was quite in accordance with the metrics of the LVOT. The annulus is on the left side, that's part of the, the slide, the uh, LVOT on the right part. And it was quite a tubular configuration when we consider the annulus and the LVOT, 26 millimeters. When we scroll, uh, we scroll up uh, to appreciate the uh, distribution of the leaflets and the aspect of the ascending heart, uh, we could identify that biker spin type one with a fusion that you can clearly see on the right part of the slide, the right pictures, a fusion we are between the uh, uh, left and the right uh, leaflets. Uh, the calcification pattern was quite uh, significant, uh, predominantly at the tips uh, of the leaflets. And when we assessed, as we do regularly here in Toulouse, and we, mm, we're going to describe that afterwards during the discussion, we did the commercial to commercial measurements four millimeters above the annulus, and it provided us with a measurement of about 28, 28.1 millimeter, so slightly uh, larger, greater than the mean perimeter derived diameter of the annulus. And when we did uh, the kind of supranular uh, tracing, it was more about 24 millimeters. So, uh, the value that uh, the metrics that we implement in our practice, this is our local practice, is a combination of the analyst 26 and the commercial to commercial distance uh, 28 for this gentleman. So the sinuses were quite wide, the coronary arteries were quite uh, uh, large, uh, the, uh, had a high takeoff. Uh, if we come back uh, just slightly on the previous slide, please. Just to illustrate the, the takeoffs, if you uh, have a close uh, look on the hockey puck view, we can see that the uh, right coronary artery has a kind of uh, unusual takeoff, and this is quite frequent in back speed anatomies. It doesn't really uh, arise from one of the sinus, uh, the, the coronary sinuses. It's more about uh, taking off uh, close to one of the commissures. So uh, it's uh, something that we see in back speed patients. So it's another argument confirming the bicuspid nature of its patient, this patient and a potential risk of uh, coronary uh, obstruction for this patient, but the coronary takeoffs were really high, more than 15 millimeters of, of both sides. So the uh, peripheral vasculature assessment, apart from uh, a mild kinking 
of the thoracic uh, descending aorta, there was nothing noticeable, straight uh, uh, common femoral artery and iliac vessels. Uh, and uh, the, um, we could see that there wasn't a major dilation, dilation of the ascending aorta. Large sinuses, but with normal metrics at the level of the ascending aorta. And uh, here you can identify the distribution of the uh, brachiocephalic trunk, uh, the supra, uh, the um, cerebral vessels. And we didn't identify any major issue that could preclude the uh, use of a cerebral protection device. But you're going to see during the live case that there was some uh, over issues to uh, uh, tackle for this patient. So in summary, here are the key, uh, clinical data and, and geographic uh, uh, met metrics for this patient. Uh, so normal LVEF, bicuspid type 1, uh, right and left uh, coronary uh, fusion uh, with, uh, without any coronary artery disease. Some quite abnormal takeoff of the right coronary artery uh, arising from one of, one of the uh, commissure. And if we apply the sizing algorithm based on the Bavard uh, registry, it was it can be considered as a kind of uh, flared configuration with the commissure to commissure distance, providing a value that is greater than the mean perimeter derived diameter of the anonymous. So this is what we have. And um, now I'm going to open up the, the floor for discussion. So Didier, you have an 81 uh, year old patient, but low risk. And uh, even after the CT analysis, looking at the calcium distribution, uh, you consider the choice of the TAVI or you had a doubt for the surgery? So it's, uh, it's a very important uh, question that you raised, uh, Chiara. It's, uh, it's, it's true that um, probably bike speed patients should be considered as uh, good candidates for surgery. Uh, here we had the combination of first the age of the patient, 81 years old, some kind of uh, past history of stroke that could put him at higher uh, risk of stroke if we uh, go for surgery. And this is something that we see. We have uh, some signals uh, through the literature. And um, also when we consider the overall anatomy of the patient based on the CT scan, it wasn't a quite complex bicuspid to treat. And this is something that we have to, uh, to combine is it, uh, what is the overall risk of the patient? And what is the procedural risk uh, based on the anatomy of the patient? And here the procedural risks were uh, quite favorable. And we had the feeling both the surgeon, the anesthesiologist, and Nicolas and myself, that we could do the procedure safely for the patient uh, without any major risk. But it's true that um, discussing the surgical options uh, are, uh, should be the first step for every single bike speed patient that we are going to uh, to treat in our at our institutions, so uh, I would like to hear from uh, from you uh, uh, also, uh, uh, Darren. Would you treat this kind of patient if it was your uh, patient? Would you do TAVI or go for surgery? Yeah, thanks, DDA. Um, I think because this gentleman is 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 over eighty years of age, uh, I think that TAVI is a very reasonable option. The second thing that you mentioned is that. This, although um, there is some calcium on the valve, we don't see excessive calcification. We don't see a, a very long calcified raffe that could make this procedure more difficult. So I think we can get a very nice result from uh, uh, from this for this patient uh, with uh, with Tavi. So you have a kind of consensus, uh, Chiara, uh, towards the transcatheter option. Yeah, of course. But uh, now that we chose the transcatheter treatment, uh, well, the question that we have is uh, how do you choose your valve in this bicuspid patient, uh, considering the type of bicuspid, the calcium you have on the leaflets, and uh, the, the, the valve that you use in your center? So it's true that uh, we are four TAVI operators. We all have the four of us experience with this type of procedure. And I'm sure that we all uh, could have four different opinions in terms of valve uh, type yeah, and valve you. size. So that's, uh, that makes the beauty and all the interest of this type of webinars to, to try to, uh, to share our experience and to try to improve our knowledge altogether. So if I, if I had um, 
uh, a choice to make for this patient. You're going to see which uh, device we've selected. Uh, we've selected mm -hmm. an Evolute uh, device. And uh, so with this device, uh, based on all the data that we have from the bike, the, the Bivolut X and the Baval registry, we decided to size based on the annulus because the, uh, as the configuration was flared, the, man, the minimal dimension was the annulus. So unfortunately for this patient, the annulus was exactly in a gray zone for an Evolut platform, a gray zone between a 29 Evolut Pro or a, a 34 Evolut R. And what uh, drove us uh, towards the final uh, size choice was the flat configuration. If it was a tapered configuration, probably the choice would have been towards a, the smaller Vive size, 29. That still represents a certain degree of oversizing, but it's not the same oversizing as a 34. So as it is a flared configuration, the 34 was our choice, Nicolas and myself. Uh, but in the tapered configuration, it could have been a, a 29. Uh, Nicolas, if you had to treat this patient with a a sapient free because we can do it with a sapient free it's, it's doable with any kind of uh, tablet devices what would be your valve uh, choice valve uh, size for this particular patient yeah, thank you didier um, as you mentioned we we can treat almost all anatomies including biker speed with uh, commercially available valves um, in my experience uh, i i try to avoid balloon expandable platform as soon as I anticipate that it would induce an excessive oversizing, exactly the same uh, thinking we have in tricuspid uh, anatomy. So basically here, uh, as it's a flare uh, uh, sizing, the minimal diameter is the annulus, not the intercommissural distance, and it is 26 millimeter. It's quite uh, generously calcified, so I would have chosen an Edwards uh, sapient free 26 millimeter. But just imagine the same flare configuration with maybe a, a 26 millimeter for the intercommensural distance and a, a 23.7 or 23.5 millimeter for the annulus, then the oversizing amount of a 26 would have been a little bit excessive. And it would have been an argument for me to go for a self-expandable valve. So it's very interesting okay. to integrate all, all these parameters, yeah. So you showed the self-expandable valve, but uh, in your practice, uh, do you plan to, before the implant, uh, a pre-dilatation in uh, each case? And it's even to you, uh, Darren, if you can share your experience, or you choose uh, in a different way if to pre-dilate in a bicuspid valve? Yeah, so thanks, Kiara. Kiara. So thanks, Kiara. We, um, we, we typically pre-dilate all bicuspids because one of the features of bicuspid um, is, is that you get fusion of the commissures. And particularly if you're using a self-expanding uh, um, system, as the valve starts to open, it can move down towards the ventricle um, uh, if the commissures are closed. So routinely, we would use a fairly, um, uh, I suppose, conservative pre-dilatation of the valve, uh, usually with a size of balloon that is um, consistent with um, the short axis of the annulus. So yeah, we would pre-dilate almost all bicuspids. One, one key thing I think to mention, Chiara, is that people all very often use um, the amount of calcium on the valve as, a, as the decision to pre-dilate or not. But particularly in bicuspids, we have seen um, uh, valves where uh, the leaflets are thickened, where the, the, there is fibrotic tissue. Uh, and it's very important, I think, on the hockey puck uh, to look for this, this type of commissural fusion for these very thickened leaflets, um, because these are valves that definitely need to be pre-dilated as well. Now, that doesn't mean we get more aggressive with the pre-dilatation. We can still be conservative, because all we're looking to do is, is open up that commissure a little bit. And we do know that if you tear a commissure in bicuspid, you can end up with significant aortic incompetence. So making sure that your platform is ready to insert very soon after the, uh, the pre-dilatation, I think is important. Um, so yes, we do the pre-dilatation, Chiara, uh, uh, with a conservative balloon uh, in all bicuspids. On the other hand, in tricuspid, we would probably only pre-dilate maybe 30, 20, 25% of valves 
So there is, a, I suppose, a different strategy up front uh, for, for bicuspids. Okay. Uh, it just um, to, um, uh, to bounce on the uh, predilatation issue, uh, we have the same uh, philosophy, Nicolas and myself. We predilate every single uh, bicuspid patient. But it brings us to the, uh, to the issue of the, the balloon, potential balloon sizing strategy. And um, I'm always puzzled with that because I, um, I tried sometimes to, uh, to predilate with a very small balloon. And the, in extremely calcified and tapered bicuspid, you, you may seal with, for example, a 14 or a 16 millimeter balloon. And no one is going to put such a small device in a, in a bicuspid patient. So um, what I've learned and um, the way I use the balloon and geography, it's more about uh, estimation, estimating the movement of the leaflets toward the coronary ostiums and to see clearly where is the potential waste. And if I, I am uh, in a gray zone, I would use a quite large balloon just to help me uh, size a little bit more. But I have to say that uh, for 100 percent sizing, I don't really use that, that technique. It's more for the leaflets and the risk of coronary obstruction, to my opinion. So I'm, I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing your, your thoughts also, both uh, Nicolas, uh, Chiara and, and Darren. What do you do? Uh, so maybe I might jump in, Didier, because we have some questions from, from the participants. And cool. now I think would be a good time because um, yeah, as I said, we predilate. We we do sometimes do a, do an aortogram uh, at the same time, but we tend to do it for for assessment of the coronary arteries to make sure that we don't have coronary artery occlusion when when the sizing is a little bit difficult. And one of the questions here relates to the case your case in particular is is there a significant risk here of coronary artery occlusion um, uh, with uh, with treating this particular patient with TAVI? What are your thoughts on that? So um, when we discussed with the, the surgeon, because uh, even our surgeons, they are uh, really uh, uh, fond of the CT scan, uh, the, <laughs> the reconstruction. So we analyze the CT scan and we decide on the overall risk of the patient. And when we, uh, we did that uh, with Nicolas, uh, if you remember the location of the, uh, the ostium of the right coronary artery, it's, it was clearly in the commissure between what is the right and what is the non-coronary non leaflet. So the risk of obstructing it with uh, some uh, tissue uh, uh, coming from the leaflets is really minimal. Uh, concerning the, the left main, uh, it, uh, it was close to the commissure, but uh, in, a, in an area that wasn't extremely calcified. So we estimated the risk of coronary obstruction to be quite low for this patient. And, uh, but it's true that this is part of the assessment of speed. Uh, the overall risk of bicuspid. What is the risk of coronary obstruction? Because to my opinion, there are two major risks uh, for bicuspid. Paravalvular regurgitation, honestly, is not anymore an issue because with the new generation devices, it works and it works pretty well. It's more rupturing the annulus and Nicolas uh, nicely uh, discussed about the risk of the gray zones patients and when how to, to decide on the valve size. Coronary uh, and also coronary obstruction. These are the main risks for, uh, according to my exper experience, rupturing the arctic root and uh, occluding the coronary. So I like the, the, the comment from, the, uh, from our, uh, our friends from the audience. It's really important to assess that. Nicolas, uh, maybe a question for you. We have, we have a couple of questions from the audience regarding the implant depth. That, you know, we hear with bicuspids, you should really implant the valve quite high, um, maybe higher than tricuspid. Um, wh what do you aim for when you're implanting the valve? What are the things that you consider when you're first of all considering your implant depth and then um, uh, when you're actually at the point of releasing uh, uh, the valve? What, what are your, your, your thoughts? So uh, I think uh, we will have a good illustration of, uh, on that uh, during the case, but my main points on that are that uh, thinking about my final depth uh, of implantation in such bicuspid anatomy, I think first about the quality of sealing uh, that I will achieve with my, my valve position and in other words, with my depth. And second, I think about potential complication related to the depth that is the pacemaker uh, dependency risk. And uh, third, I think uh, that is related to the first point to a technical uh, issue that is, um, is my depth of implantation safe enough in case I have to post-dilate? And we'll see that sometimes we have to consider post-dilating 
for paravalvular leak reduction and also for circularity of the frame. So integrating all of that, I would say that uh, although it's true that there is this common idea that we have to implant valves higher in bike speeds, in practical experience, I would say that finally, it's not that much higher than in a, a dry speed, in bike speeds. And I think it's a thing that we noticed uh, when we analyzed post-CT, uh, post-implant CTs, uh, uh, especially in the Bavard registry. And so if we uh, go to the Bavard, Chiara, uh, to, um, do you uh, remind, can you remind us about the depth the average depth of implant in uh, in Bavard because you were one of the main uh, offer. Yeah, we we had the depth implantation uh, between zero and three millimeters, and um, it seemed to be okay in our bike speed uh, population. Yeah. So um, I agree with Nicolas. And uh, <laughs> since we are talking about bike speed and uh, pre dilatation, and we have a patient that had a previous stroke. So the question is, uh, did you use and do you plan even the use of cerebral uh, embolic protection device when treating uh, a bicuspid patient like this one with Tavi? Nicola, maybe, <laughs> yeah, I, I can start with, with that one. Uh, very simply, uh, for cerebral embolic protection device, so far we don't have any strong evidence in any subset of patients, but we know all the rationale. We have recent uh, data showing that the subgroup of bike speed patient uh, is at higher risk of stroke and may benefit more for cerebral embolic protection. And I think saying that about the STS-TVT registry that was reported during last TCT, clearly showing that trend, even though it's not significant. So to simply answer uh, your question, Kara, it's true that in each bike speed complex procedure, because of the underlying anatomy and because of the higher complexity of a procedure with recaptures pre post dilatation, we try to use cerebral embolic protection uh, device, except in the case you, you're going to see for the reasons that would be explained. Maybe just one more question then guys, before we, uh, before we move to the case. Um, DDA, there's a, there's a question regarding the, the CT analysis up front and, and determining the coplanar and the, the, the cusp overlap view. Um, can you maybe give us your thoughts on, 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 on what implant view you're using and so forth for these bicuspid patients? So this is a crucial point and it seems that we have uh, a quite uh, a very high level of comments uh, here. So what I, what I would say is that uh, in this particular uh, configuration uh, for this patient that we're going to discuss today, we have a fusion between the uh, left and the right cor uh, coronary cusp. So it's more or less uh, quite favorable because we're going to do the cusp overlap as we do uh, in regular tricuspid patients. But sometimes when you have a fusion between the, the, the right and the non or the non and the left, it can be a little bit more or more challenging. Uh, so you need to work on the, um, the CT scan uh, analysis. And what I try to do is to uh, put dots exactly in the middle of the sinuses, what could be the sinuses if they were clearly identified, just to, uh, to find out, to superimpose uh, the, fused, the dots of the fused uh, leaflets and to try to find out a view that is favorable uh, to deploy the device and that offers the kind of uh, nice overlap between the fused uh, leaflets and the opposite one. In, for type zero, uh, sometimes it's, uh, it's really challenging. So uh, I would say that most of the time the RAO codal view work, you can tr try like that. Uh, but sometimes you, achieving a really coplanar view, it's, it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not easy. But this is something that we need to work up, uh, on upfront because during the procedure, adjusting the final, uh, the work in projection sometimes is quite tricky. So we need to anticipate that. And uh, it's a very important comment from the, uh, from the audience. Perfect. So maybe two, two final questions from the audience. Um, one which I can address now. Uh, when do you protect the coronary ostea, uh, particularly in patients with bicuspid? I think the important thing is that you, you look to see are the coronary ostea low? Uh, are your sinuses narrow? Do you have very bulky leaflets, either thickened fibrotic leaflets or uh, calcific leaflets that can potentially 
uh, come in front of the coronary ostea. And, and certainly my experience has been that if there's any doubt at all, we protect the coronary ostea. We just do not take chances with this because it is a very difficult complication to treat if you're not prepared. Um, maybe we can uh, come back to that. And one point we will come back to uh, for, for the, uh, the participants online is tips and tricks for post dilatation. Um, uh, we, we're, we're going to see maybe one or two tips and tricks as we go along through the case. Uh, I'm sure that the guys from Toulouse are going to give us some good pointers. But Nicholas, I'm going to come back to you in terms of uh, uh, how to post dilate in bicuspid aortic valves uh, uh, after the case. Um, so Chiara, thanks for leading that discussion. That was great. Uh, and maybe now we'll get on and, uh, and see how you guys uh, uh, treated this particular patient. So if we can roll the video, that would be fantastic. Welcome in uh, Clinic Pasteur for this uh, a case um, of Tavi in bicuspid anatomic patient. So my partner to my left is Didier, who will perform the case. Didier, you, you can maybe just directly uh, tell us what is the setting for this patient? So, um, as you see, as you saw, it's, uh, this is a quite complex patient, so, but uh, nevertheless, we will aim at uh, performing a streamlined, optimized uh, transfemoral procedure. Uh, so, basically, we have two radial axes. Uh, one is the right radial axis. It was quite challenging to get access to the right uh, radial artery because it was a very, uh, very fading uh, pulse, very uh, small one. And uh, this uh, is meant uh, to uh, um, uh, allow, enable the placement of the sentinel device, the cerebral protection device. Uh, but we're going to see afterwards, we're going to show afterwards uh, why it, it won't be possible in that case. The, re the left uh, radial axis is a six French one, uh, long uh, to accommodate the blood pressure uh, monitoring uh, during the whole procedure, and out a five French uh, pictal catheter to guide the, the angiography guiding the procedure uh, and the deployment of the, uh, the valve. So, um, Nicolas, we will, before we go for the echo guided uh, puncture, and also as you can see, we will uh, pace through the left ventricular wire. Uh, and we will describe that afterwards when it will be a uh, time during the procedure. So before we go to the echo guided puncture, would you drive us through the couple of angels that we've obtained? Yeah, it's, yeah. so uh, as you mentioned, we initially planned to put a, a sentinel device because very strong rationale in bicuspid and a uh, patient, but you see on the, on your screen that uh, we we realized that the right brachial artery is occluded eh, as a chronic occlusion, so it's impossible to navigate through that. Uh, explaining uh, why uh, in that case we won't be able to put the, the cerebral protection device. Uh, we also recorded uh, this first angio, so you see before contrast injection the amount of calcium, the calcium burden. Of, uh, of, this, um, of this anatomy, and it's an uh, aero caudal view, namely cusp of the lab view mm -hmm. that will be used during deployment. Um, and you see also one uh, particular feature of that case, that is a takeoff of the right uh, coronary artery, just in the commissure between, uh, between two uh, leaflets. And uh, we'll, we'll discuss how, how to handle that and uh, how mm. to manage that. And, uh, and you see also here uh, LAO uh, projection, LAO uh, angio view, um, but also illustrates the calcium burden. It's the one we use for final release and final assessment before release at the end. And we see an amount of uh, AR here uh, that will maybe also uh, impact a little bit our technique and, uh, and we'll discuss that. Perfect. Uh, so uh, let's uh, go back now for the uh, echo guided puncture. So we're going to use a, a regular uh, vascular uh, probe. So the idea is that is to uh, find out in the uh, longitudinal uh, axis the location of the femoral bifurcation. So here we are. And we're going to scroll uh, more cranial just to identify the common femoral artery. So we see that uh, there is some uh, calcium, but here we have the femoral head that, uh, that points at uh, six o'clock. I'm a little bit compressing the, the vessel, but it's fine. And it seems that here I have uh, what could be the maximal uh, diameter so that we can target that. So I'm gonna start by uh, doing some kind of uh, local anesthesia. So you see the needle, and I'm really going to target uh, the, uh, the adventitia and doing the local anesthesia uh, backwards. So uh, would you like to comment, Nico? Why do we do, uh, why is it so important to do so? Uh, we, we noticed by, by starting doing that, that uh, 
the, the quality of uh, local anesthesia provided by this eco guidance is is really really much higher than the the, the one we use to to do uh, just uh, guided by uh, uh, x-rays and uh, and the patient no longer feel any discomfort at the time afterwards at the time of introduction of a, mm. of a large sheath so here we see the the needle i guess if we enter here there is a plaque yeah. but we we may have a little bit more cranial just to get rid of that plaque so here we have a nice tenting this is a maximal diameter so i'm going to enter that but you have a different uh, a strategy nicolas no it, it, it's just uh, one step uh, that is uh, added uh, especially when you have a little bit less experience of echo guidance uh, because in long axis, the issue is that you're not perfectly sure that you're central. Uh, so once you are tenting on the roof of the femoral artery, as you did, you can uh, uh, rotate 90 degrees clockwise or counterclockwise and uh, and then assess that your needle is really central. But with your experience, Didier, what you're doing is just making sure that in long axis, you see the maximal and the larger diameter of the artery that is a kind of surrogate for you to be sure that you're already central. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So it's uh, a step uh, less uh, than what you do, but if you, we want to do it uh, more academic and uh, safer uh, when you start your, your experience, maybe doing your technique, starting longitudinal and then rotating counterclockwise to see, to see the short axis makes sense because you really uh, know where you are. Yeah. But if you have the maximum diameter, as you said, in longitudinal axis, you are more or less sure to be uh, quite central. Uh, so uh, the proglides, I'm going to use them uh, in a regular way, uh, as the, we don't have any uh, maximum calcification. I don't need to go for a parallel uh, proglide technique, so it's going to be a, a regular uh, one. So do you have some uh, advice concerning the parallel uh, proglide technique? Yeah, the, the, most of the time uh, I, I put the proglides uh, crossed, uh, DJ, yeah. at uh, two and uh, uh, ten and, and two o'clock. Uh, if we figure out um, a clocking representation. It's true that the, the parallel technique sometimes also helps when you have, for example, a failure of insertion of your first proglide because of, of some fibrotic plaque. Uh, then it can be, uh, can be useful to switch your strategy and to put them parallel. It's really simple and you, 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 you push on the left uh, uh, side of a vessel to con make your first connection with a first proglide and you push on the right side uh, to do your second connection for, for your second proglide. Really, you, you really um, tailor that to uh, what you, do, you discover at the, at the time of uh, first connection of the first device. Yeah, okay. So here it was the, the regular uh, way with two uh, proglides, uh, two o'clock and 10 o'clock. And then we're gonna use a nine French just to uh, serve as a kind of conduit just to, to house the uh, uh, Lundquist wire. Thank you, Nico. And then using that short 180 Lundquist wire, we will uh, be able to bring in the uh, 16 French shift that is required uh, to uh, uh, cross the valve and uh, do the hemodynamic assessment and anything, place the, the stiff wire before going uh, shiftless with uh, the uh, inline shift of the uh, Evolute platform. So here, no major uh, difficulties in advancing the six-skin French shift. So the patient is under uh, conscious uh, sedation with uh, some uh, uh, local anesthesia. Okay. So what? Uh, which catheter is that, Nico? For it's an uh, um, L1, uh, Didier. That uh, that is our regular catheter for crossing. Uh, you will use that uh, with a combination of a straight uh, O35 wire. Um, it's true that uh, in bike speed anatomy sometimes it's a little mm. bit more difficult. I, I, I see your, your tip that, uh, that you're always using when you're crossing and maybe it's worth uh, sharing that. Yeah, so uh, if we can uh, zoom on uh, 
on the drape here, so you, you see it. What I do is for the distal two centimeters of the wire, add a small uh, 45 degrees bend, uh, degrees bend, and this is going to provide more um, uh, movement, uh, latitude of movement to be able to map the, the surface of the valve, particularly in uh, horizontal configurations with large anatomies. So this is uh, something that, uh, that may be useful. It's a small trick. Uh, but uh, sometimes it's quite useful. And then the technique we're going to use, uh, Nicolas is the regular uh, ones, uh, mapping the valve, um, starting uh, just uh, below the left main in the left coronary cusp, and then uh, doing that mapping from uh, top to bottom of the, the valve. Here, I can clearly see the amount of calcium. And so uh, it's, uh, uh, we're going to start with that wire. And if it fails, uh, do you have another uh, option in terms yeah. of wire? So most of the time in biker speed, we know that uh, we experience some most more difficulties to cross. So uh, after 20 to 30 seconds of, uh, of attempts, if it doesn't succeed with such wire, we go for a terimo. Uh, another option also is uh, in large anatomies to use a, a larger curve of uh, Amplatz left uh, uh, catheter, uh, L2. Sometimes you, you have a, a better trajectory in the ascending aorta to cross. Yeah, it's true the, that the implants left two could be an option here because it's a, it's a quite a large anatomy. So. But let's start with, uh, with that for 10 additional seconds, 30 seconds, and then we'll see if it's, uh, yeah. But I see, uh, I meet a lot of friction. So let's, yeah. let's uh, use the second uh, combination. So implants left one and a straight terimo wire. So we're gonna use the same uh, technique just to uh, just to cross the valve. It's Do true uh, that the, um, the Terimo um, wire is, is really highly performing. The only uh, uh, limitation that uh, it has is that it's very, very slippery and go, goes easily uh, towards the coronary arteries. So, of course, uh, you have to be cautious about yeah, that. It's true that, yeah. You can create the dissections. But um, it's a combination we use for biker speed or, or uh, stenotic aortic valve in valve also, for example. So definitely uh, a challenging uh, anatomy, but yeah. it seems that the terumo went through. So I'm going to follow your advice as it is a quite uh, uh, stiff wire and uh, the risk of perforation is not minimal. I'm going to stop there and, and use a regular O35 wire. Okay. Just to enter. To enter the left ventricle yeah, safely. More safely. Okay. Good advice. In order not to uh, perforate the, the the ventricle. So here it's going to be a little bit easier to get access. And you yeah. see, uh, you see the uh, location of the the implants. Huh? Yeah, I think it's a very also um, procedural technical consideration, but. Uh, uh, that is important. You see that as opposed to a tricuspid anatomy here, uh, the catheter and the wires are uh, stuck by the by the bicuspid anatomy, and we see that we are in the middle of the calcifications. We are not falling into commissures. Yeah. So Didier, here um, is the hemodynamic assessment at the baseline. Um, so of course, uh, huge gradients. Uh, we see that the pressure of this patient is a little mm. bit low, probably because of the uh, uh, severity of ETS, the arctic regurgitation we have. We hope it, it will be improved by the predilitation. And we keep in mind for a final assessment the arctic diastolic pressure uh, that is currently uh, at uh, 40, and the LV and diastolic pressure that is at um, uh, 15, let's say. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so let's go for the insertion of the uh, regular uh, safari. The one that we use is the safari uh, small curve, the, the medium curve. And uh, most of the time it, accom it accommodates uh, uh, the vast uh, majority of the, uh, the ventricles. So let's see how, how it extrudes. Uh, so definitely, clearly the uh, uh, position of the, uh, the implants left is not uh, helpful because of the calcium, but we should improve that with the predilatation. Uh, talking about pre-deal, pre uh, Nico, which uh, uh, size of balloon uh, did we uh, select? Yeah, it's, um, I think important to, to discuss that now. It's, it's true that it's a step that is 
most of the time currently uh, skipped for regular TAVI procedures, but most of the time, uh, almost always, I would say uh, we keep it for biker speed uh, TAVI uh, procedures because of the calcium burden, because of uh, the difficulties we might have to cross uh, with the device afterwards. And uh, to keep it on the safe side, what we do is we choose the balloon size according to the minimal diameter of the uh, measured annulus. Uh, yeah. That here was 20, yeah. so it will be a 20 millimeter balloon. Okay. And it's true that the patient also uh, already has some kind of regurgitation at baseline, yeah. so probably we should avoid to be too aggressive. So before uh, entering the anatomy, I'm just going to connect uh, the pacing system. So you, it's a crocodile uh, clamp pacing system that we're going to use. One hand is going to be connected at the skin of the patient. You, you may use a needle uh, preferably in the opposite groin just to keep it safe for you, or use a uh, directly the incision that has been made at the skin to put your crocodile clamp. And then the other hand is going to be connected uh, to the distal tip uh, of, the, of the wire, distal hand of the wire. So go, we're, go, we're going to pace at 180. Okay, so pacing on Rosa. Okay, Nico, you may inflate. Okay, balloon up. And injection. Okay. Okay. Balloon pacing off. Okay. So let's review that. So we're gonna withdraw the balloon and then let the patient recover and review the uh, angiography that we've uh, obtained. Okay. Okay. So here we see the uh, the inflation. So the positioning of the the balloon. Uh, we're going to watch for several information. We, we want to see if the, the balloon is stable. Yeah. So it seems to be uh, stable during inflation. Whether the pacing is accurate also, because yeah. we will discuss that, but we'll, we'll need that for deployment. And in case of AV block also, we will pace through the, through the wire. And we, uh, when we watch the, uh, the movement of the, the calcium, the tip of the fused leaflets, the right and the, the left, that are on the uh, right upmost part of the screen, there is still room uh, in yeah. regards to the left main. So it should be safe in terms of uh, left main uh, coronary occlusion. For the right, we're going to figure out with the commissural alignment. Okay. Good. So let's uh, change our gloves and then we're going to go for the procedure. So let's now insert the, the valve. It, it's an uh, Evrut R34, eh, Didier, that, yeah. uh, that was uh, cho chosen according to the sizing we discussed uh, and, uh, with a CT scan. So here you are. So what we want to achieve is to align the commissures of, uh, of a transcatheter head valve with the commissures of a native valve. What we know is how uh, uh, the leaflets are mounted into uh, the frame of the Evolute and how the frame is mounted inside the cafeter. And basically, to simplify that, uh, it has been shown uh, by uh, post tabu CT procedures that if we introduce uh, the cafeter in that direction, putting the flush ports not pointing at noon, but pointing at 3 o'clock, uh, we will have a high likelihood at the end uh, to have the commissures of a transcatheter at valve that will be aligned uh, with a commissure of a nate valve. Okay, thank you. Very clear explanation. So uh, let's uh, proceed. I don't have any major friction. So we did uh, check the, the valve. It's, uh, it was uh, properly loaded. So we're going to see and zoom in just, as, just to illustrate the once again the commissural uh, alignment uh, a technique. Yeah, and you see that uh, now a second uh, uh, visual landmark to uh, assess this commissure alignment is to focus on the distal tip of the delivery capture, and you see that you you have a, a, a radio peak ring, and uh, if you carefully watch this radio peak ring, you see that on the right it's uh, just a flat ring. And on the left, it's a, a little bit thicker, and it's what is called the hat marker. And uh, another uh, um, possibility to ensure that we will uh, have this good commercial alignment when we arrive in LAO uh, projection is to have this hat uh, marker position uh, as it is right now. Okay.
So here we, it seems that we are we're good. Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to reposition the pigtail. And then we will uh, go to our, uh, we'll go to the cusp of a live view. Yeah. So it was RAO uh, 15 code old 10. And in that view, you're going to see that the, uh, the heart marker now is more or less central. Huh? Yeah, as a different configuration. Yeah. Let me record that. Okay. Okay. But it's a, um, a confirmation in a almost orthogonal view that we, we have reached that. Okay, so let's start with the deployment as usual for the cusp uh, for the high deployment in the cusp of a lab view. Uh, we're going to start above the analyst. Uh, we have a small superimposition of the catheter, but it's fine. So you you may proceed, Nico. Do you want to make an angio DDA yeah. to, to have a baseline okay, nice. recording? Okay, so we have now clear visual uh, uh, targets, visual landmarks in mind. Uh, you made a small adjustment yet to, to have a better alignment here. And um, idea while I'm, I'm starting to extrude the valve, idea of uh, this technique of deployment is to minimize uh, the interaction the, with a conduction tissue in the LVOTD. Eh? Yeah, so exactly. So we really target a high position. Okay, so let's record that to see where we are. Okay. Okay, so that is fine. Do you want us to start pacing now to, to stabilize for, yeah. for further steps? Yeah. So one, uh, 120, let's pace at 120. Because we, we saw and we mentioned initially that we had some amount of regurg. Yeah. So this, this could create pacing on. some instability. Okay. And at that step, it's useful to pace just to... Okay, inject. Okay, quite Good stable. position, yeah. yeah. And we see the amount of constraint because it's a bike speed anatomy. So yeah. Okay, pacing off. So let's see if there are any uh, conduction disturbance. There is a LBBB. Yeah. Left bundle branch block, but no, uh, uh, no major uh, high degree AV block. So we need uh, to let the blood pressure to recover. Let's uh, uh, inject to see if we have a, a, a regurgitation or not. This could be an issue here. So no major regurgitation. Yeah, no major regurgitation, Didier. High position, uh, clearly uh, constrained frame. Yeah, uh, under expansion. Uh, in, in, under expansion uh, and very constrained frame here in that position. So here, basically, discussion is around two options. Darren and, uh, and Chiara, maybe Chiara, you can come first. Basically, Having seen what, that, uh, would you deploy the valve here or would you go for another uh, option? It's good that there is no PVL, but uh, indeed I will think it's quite high and constrained. So don't you have the risk that uh, the valve will pop out uh, if it's too high? And uh, um, I don't know if it's too constrained, you have to post dilate later and do you have any option to prevent the post dilation. I don't know. Okay, good. Darren, what you yeah, so your, it's, uh, your choice? So I, I think first uh, you, you had a beautiful implant. It was very stable during deployment, even in that yeah. uh, quite horizontal anatomy. Uh, thus, the, the advantage of the pacing. But but really, I think if you look closely, you're probably a millimeter above above the annulus. Um, now we do know in bicuspids it's okay to implant a little bit higher because usually the calcium is six to eight millimeters above the level of the of the annulus. But in this case, um, if I remember correctly, the calcium was on the tips of the leaflets, which is almost a, a tricuspid-like pattern. And so I, I would agree. I think in, in this particular anatomy, it's a little bit high, and you have indeed some uh, um, some malexpansion of the valve. However, you do see that at its very worst in that REO caudal position because you're looking at the short axis of the valve. So I would probably um, do a, a, I suppose a micro reposition, recapture a little bit, get it a couple of millimeters lower and go again. Okay, thanks, Darren. So let's, let's come back to the case now. Uh, to assess the position in LAO to ensure that the depth is not um, too minimal to uh, leave the valve here and to post dilate. Yeah or uh, to recapture and go for a slightly different position, uh, thinking that the first deployment will have acted as a kind of mechanical predilitation of, a, of an anatomy. 
and uh, and we might have a, a better uh, better outcome uh, by doing that. So what we can uh, do also is to record in that projection yeah, in the yeah. LAO and see what we have. Exactly. And here we see clearly that it's a very high position. Yeah. It's it's close to be zero uh, in the NCC uh, location yeah. and one to two in the uh, left. Uh, left to right uh, fused uh, commissures leaflets. Yeah. So we have room to deploy it low, uh, uh, a little bit deeper. Yeah. But at the end, we have no regurgitation. So it's a it's a real point of discussion. Maybe we could go one millimeter deeper. Yeah, and I, I think the major uh, argument for that, if if we we were in a, a tricuspid anatomy without such constraints on the frame, I would be happy to release it like yeah. that. With uh, amount the burden of calcium that ensure a, a good stability of a, of a valve, but here uh, regarding the, this constraint, we know that we'll probably have to post dilate, and it's true that with such a high position, we we don't have any safety margin for post dilatation. Yeah. Okay. So let's uh, we go a little bit deeper. Yeah. So let's come back uh, to, okay. our, to our the projection. To the projection. Okay. So we're going to paste during this phase at 120. Yeah, just to reposition and then reopen. It's OK, pacing on. And it's maybe important idea that you comment on what you're doing on the capture to avoid uh, uh, sending out a pop-up. Yeah, I'm phase. just uh, applying uh, pressure on the catheter. And then what, once, we, once we lose contact, as it is now, we're going to reassess everything. OK. OK, let's uh, inject to see. Okay. Okay. Let's uh, start here. I will reposition a little bit higher. Okay, here it's fine. So now I feel that you're pulling yeah. a little bit. And you see we're going to record that. Okay, pacing off. But uh, we clearly see now, as compared to the previous uh, previous uh, image, but the, the, the constraint is, is less it's important. Less, uh, huh? We have a bit greater okay. expansion, and yeah. that's something that we've uh, uh, experienced several times. If you reshift and go one or two millimeters deeper, this is not an extremely deep position, no, no. but you get a frame that is more open. Okay, so let's, um, I think we, uh, we can re uh, reassess in LAO and then decide whether or not to uh, uh, leave the device here. Okay. Yeah, still high position. Still high, but, uh, yeah, yeah. We are slightly lower than uh, initially. Yeah, it's, it's one millimeter lower. Yeah. It's true that in that view, uh, the the actual uh, assessment of uh, the true depth in the LVOT is not correct, and that's why the the yeah. curve overlap view that was uh, was developed, and we have this redundant uh, non coronary sinus that is uh, that is really deep. But we saw uh, what depth we had in the in the cusp of the And I have to say that I, I like that. Uh, yeah, depth I like it. Now. I yeah. like it. You like it also. So yeah. So let's go for the final uh, release. So the first thing I'm going to do, uh, you may do, Nico, is to uh, slightly pull on the wire. Yeah. We have large sinuses, so just for the purpose of making sure that we keep everything at target, uh, we're going to uh, release, uh, leaving the pigtail, and then we're going to withdraw it afterwards. Okay. So I'm now releasing it. So I'm slightly maintaining the coaxiality, not pushing too much. It's just about making sure that we have everything remaining coaxial. OK. Good. So it seems that we are released. We may withdraw the noscone. We're going to reinsert now the 16 French uh, sheath. There is no conduction disturbance. And then go for the assessment and decide whether or not we need to uh, post dilate. Yeah. Didier, so here is the, um, the assessment after final release. Uh, you have on your screen the, the hemodynamic recording. Uh, of course, no significant gradient. Significant difference between aortic diastolic pressure yeah. and uh, LV and diastolic pressure. Uh, we also have a look at the ECG, important uh, outcome. So no uh, third degree AV block. We had a um, quite wide QRS, yeah. but uh, 
we'll see the evolution about that and uh, there, there's nothing we can do uh, against that. Okay, huh? so let's go for the final, uh, for the Andrew assessment. So uh, the first thing we need to uh, do is to, uh, uh, we throw the pigtail. So what I'm gonna do, it's a small trick that we use if we uh, purposely uh, decide to uh, leave the pigtail jailed, you, we uh, use a, a wire, a regular wire, the J wire, just to withdraw it. So you're gonna see that the JL pigtail, I'm going to extrude the wire, and it's the wire that is going to help us uh, just withdraw safely uh, the, uh, the, um, the pigtail uh, catheter. So it's really important if you decide to JL the pigtail to use the wire uh, to withdraw it. So let's uh, uh, connect, and then we will do the, the final NGO. Okay, excellent. So uh, I'm going to use once again the wire just to uh, withdraw the uh, the pigtail for the hemodynamics, and we will go for the uh, uh, assessment of the angiographic results. But here, in already uh, in terms of the uh, of um, uh, diastolic aortic pressure, it's good. We yeah. shouldn't face a major regurgitation. I, I don't guess. think so. Yeah. But uh, so let, we have two views. The first one was uh, the uh, LAO uh, view. What could be a kind of uh, uh, free cusp of a view? It was a uh, even more, even AP more uh, cranial, and you, we see all the calcium surrounding the uh, the stent frame. So let's inject. So depth, the depth is good because yeah. this is the coplanar view. Yeah. And we see that we are two or three millimeters below the annulus. Depth is good. I think ceiling is good also. We have on, only trace or almost non uh, arctic regurgitation so happy with that didier yeah another important uh, assessment on that is the the commercial issue so we see that uh, we have a c tab that is at the old flow portion of the uh, of the frame showing um, us how the commissures of uh, the transcatheter valve are positioned and we see uh, indirect good perfusion of both coronary arteries left main no issue but the right that was uh, coming from the commissure between two, uh, yeah. two valves uh, is, is okay. So happy with that. So now maybe aerial uh, assessment. Yeah, to check the stand frame in two uh, orthogonal views. So a small constraint, but it seems to be open. Yeah. Let's record that. And here we see an overestimation of the depth, but definitely no regurgitation. So yeah. that's something that we can achieve with uh, new generation devices. Yeah. Is it necessary to post dilate? I don't think so. I don't think so. Also, no. uh, because the constrained portion uh, that houses the leaflet seems to be uh, quite uh, wide open. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it should be okay. And what we've learned uh, recently, and Didier, uh, maybe mostly with uh, high pressure non compliant balloons post dilatation in in uh, evolutive uh, frames and valves, is that we can damage by too aggressive yeah. post dilatation. We can damage the leaflet posts and the leaflets. So let's keep on the on the safe side here. The rationale to post dilate would be to have maybe a, a higher uh, circularity, but mm. the, at that step, it's it's good. It's already good, yeah. And uh, hemodynamic function of the valve is good, so I, I don't see major argument to post dilate here. Okay, nice. So let's go for the the closure. It would be through the pigtail. The angiography will be done through the pigtail uh, coming from the left uh, radio, and we're going to close the proglides. Didier, here is the, the final outcome after uh, vascular closure. So our regular uh, technique, two proglides, uh, all 35 j uh, wire jailed, uh, um, an angel seal on top of that if uh, there is residual bleeding. You see the angel, that is quite good. Yeah, there is no uh, no bleeding. Yeah, so uh, good case. Maybe you can make a, a wrap up yeah. about uh, what we've learned. So this was a very uh, uh, complex case, uh, but interested one, interesting one with a very nice outcome for the patient. We're going to discuss that afterwards during the webinar. But just uh, the key learnings immediately um, uh, during the uh, this case is first um, the challenges of uh, bike speed crossing. We're seeing how we we had to uh, change the strategy to be able uh, to cross uh, and then the value of uh, pre-dilatation just to make sure that we can safely appreciate the risk of uh, obstruction and most importantly uh, cross the valve safely and uh, uh, in a stable fashion uh, pos uh, position it deploy it uh, we've seen that the evolute platform is very suited to bicuspid uh, auric valves even in complex 
anatomies with large uh, uh, chunk of calcium, diffuse calcifications of the leaflets, it works. We have to apply the contemporary technique that you nicely described, Nicolas, with the uh, cusp overlap and the uh, commercial alignment. It seems that we achieved the goal, no regurgitation, no uh, high degree conduction disturbance for this patient and no vascular complications. So all uh, the uh, items uh, are uh, fulfilled for this patient. Uh, we're going to update you afterwards on the uh, cerebral status of the, the patient, uh, but it, it seems to be okay. So thank you. Thank you, Elena. Uh, thank you, Rosario. And let's go and discuss with Darren and Chiara now. Thank you. Bye. Okay, so um, I wanted just to, before we start the discussion uh, with uh, all our friends uh, online, uh, just to update you on the outcome for this uh, patient. So there is uh, one slide that is going to summarize everything. Uh, so you could see um, that um, you can see that the uh, hospital course was uh, really nice for the patient without any event. Discharge on day three, no conduction disturbance greater than the left bundle branch block that we saw. The EOA was very large, 1.87 centimeters square with a very low mean gradient, and this was quite surprising. We knew that uh, based on the Bible X and all the registries with this platform that uh, single digits uh, uh, mean gradients could be achieved, but here it, it was really low. Uh, no reg regurgitation, and on the CT scan assessment, you could see the overall uh, circularity of the device. There was one point of constraint uh, in a relation with the most uh, utmost uh, calcified portion uh, towards the, uh, um, the the left main, the, the left coronary cusp, what could be the left coronary cusp, uh, but the mean implant depth was less than three. It was 2.8 exactly uh, as we discussed. Uh, so uh, all the uh, the outcomes were, were really good for the for the patient. Didier, that's fantastic to see. Thanks for that. And congratulations to you guys on a great case. Um, we have some really brilliant questions from the audience. Um, uh, and, and I think let's, let's work through those. Um, first question from, from Christian Popescu, maybe for you, uh, Nicola. Um, in relation to the right coronary artery, a little bit worried about coronary artery occlusion, but it seems you guys were happy that, uh, that this was not an issue for you and you didn't need to protect. Maybe a comment on that. Yeah, the comment uh, Didier mentioned that it's a point that has to be anticipated at CT scan uh, assessment pre-op, of course. Uh, here, the point that uh, the coronary takeoff was just in front of a commissure between two leaflets, and uh, then the the height that there were there were um, virtually no uh, tissue, native tissue that was uh, uh, um, threatened and that was possible to be pushed by the frame in front of a right coronary tree, explaining why we were confident. Okay, great. Didier, another question, uh, important one, I think. It seems like you were right on the, the, the differential between two valve sizes, 29, 34. There is a question as to why you chose the 34 in this patient rather than a 29. You might take us through that. Exactly, and this is a very important point. And what we saw, and we're gonna see that through, uh, if we have time through a couple of slides, uh, concerning the registries, with these platforms, we can achieve no regurgitation, whether it be the sapient-free or the able platform, no regurgitation should be one of the goals. So the idea is to seal properly, but to make sure with this platform that the constrained portion that houses the leaflet is wide open. And this is the same diameter for the 29 and the 34. You're going to, uh, so more or less, it's the same thing. Uh, so uh, what we, we observed uh, during the sizing was a flared uh, configuration with the ICD being uh, close to more than 10% greater than the mean perimeter derived diameter of the annulus. So sizing is based on the annulus in that configuration. As it is in the gray zone and above the annulus, it seems to be a little bit wider. The 34 makes sense. If we had the different configuration with above the annulus that Volcano configuration that you nicely uh, demonstrated, uh, uh, Darren, in various lectures. We need to choose the smaller valve size. It's still oversizing, but it's not the same amount of oversizing as if it was a 34. We need to keep some oversizing for biker speed, with, with, but we need to uh, apply the proper amount. Here in that flared configuration, 34, and you could see that it met the job because one of the, the goal is to achieve no regurgitation for these patients. Perfect. Chiara, a, 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 a question relating to the, the horizontal aorta. Um, do we need to implant very high on the non-coronary cusp to try and 
to try and make sure we're not too low on the left hand side in these horizontal anatomies? Indeed, even this uh, horizontal anatomy with the um, cusp overlap view, they demonstrated that they really obtained a good depth implantation in the non coronary sinus. And uh, even when you move to the LAO and you see that uh, maybe the depth is, uh, is not as you imagine in the, in the contralateral view. Indeed, if you are below the non coronary cusp, you are below all the cusps. And so your implantation is high, but not too high. And it's okay for um, even in a, bicuspid, um, in a bicuspid patient. This is horizontal. So maybe with the evolute, uh, with the, with the evolute platform, is uh, easier to, to, to analyze the correct implantation and to, to prevent the follow of the valve in the, in the ventricle. But the, the, I think that the view with the RAO and LAO in this patient was perfect. Yeah, so I think that's a really great learning point that take just because you have one view, that doesn't mean that you can't take another view to make sure that you can use, I suppose, the, 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 the recapturable feature of this valve. This is one of the great, I suppose, evolutions in, in TAVI technology that if we're not sure, take another view, make sure we're at the appropriate depth. And like we saw here, reposition the valve if you're not comfortable. Uh, Nicola, an another question for you. There, there was a little bit of confusion around, around the hat marker um, and, and commissural alignment. Um, can you maybe just take a moment to run through that for us again? Yeah, yeah, of course, uh, Darren, it's very important. So. Uh, the, the goal is to achieve commissural alignment of a, a transcatheter head valve as compared to the native valve. And, and we can discuss that in general uh, um, domain, not only for bicuspid, but also for tricuspid. So as I mentioned, you have several uh, ways to ensure that. Uh, so uh, we discussed about the flush port. Now regarding the heart marker, you saw the heart marker that is visible on the catheter. It's a visual uh, radiopaque landmark. And uh, uh, what, just to be to say it uh, simply, what you need to achieve if you want to achieve commissural alignment is when you are on LAO projection, you have to have a heart marker on the outer curvature of the aorta on the left on your image. And uh, when you are in the cusp of a like view that is almost an orthogonal view, then you have to have a heart marker almost in the center front of your, of your delivery capture. And this will basically ensure uh, that you will have a proper commissural alignment in most of the anatomies. Perfect. So the way I think about it, Nicholas, LAO, when you're coming around the arch, hat marker on the outside. Yeah. When you're coming down to the valve, hat marker on the outside. And then when you move to the cusp, the cusp overlap, hat marker right in the center. Yeah. It's a great, great way to, to memorize that. Didier, quick question regarding vascular closure, uh, Manta versus two proglides versus one proglide and an angio seal. Um, do we have any uh, evidence that, 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 these are, um, that, that these are different? Uh, does it come down to uh, so how comfortable you are and perhaps the cost of these devices? Yeah, so it's a very, very complex uh, question. I'm, going to, I'm trying to make it short. Use whatever you want. If you compare proglide uh, to uh, Manta, basically the rate of major vascular complication is the same. The price is not the same depending on your uh, FK reimbursement, so you have to implement that. The thing is to master one of these devices and to use it properly. If we uh, come now to the proglide, there is a trend to use one proglide and systematically an angel seal. It works. So if you want to implement that in your practice, it's fine. And it's uh, when we use it in Toulouse, the single proglide is pr mainly for very small vessels. If you have very small vessel, we're going to use the smaller, uh, the better profile uh, catheters. So mainly the Evolute R, that is a true 14 French uh, device. And you may uh, seal the vessel with only one proglide. For the over, in the other cases, what we regularly do, Nicolas and myself, we use two proglides, the regular technique. And if we have a residual bleeding on top of that, we, we add an angel seal. It works and it still keeps the access for the vessel because as we are still doing the echo guided puncture, we can clearly decide to puncture above or below the plug uh, with the angel seal. So it's, uh, it doesn't preclude any further puncture of the vessel. Use whatever you want, try to master it. I think it's a great answer. 
Chiara, one final question, uh, that, uh, and please, uh, as an audience, keep your questions coming. We'll, we'll stop and answer them throughout, throughout the next 30 minutes. Um, Chiara, Safari Wire, why are the guys using Safari? Is there a difference between Safari and Confida? Is there a role still for, um, for, for non-pre-shaped wires such as Lunderquist or the Amplats or Superstiff? Well, my experience above all in Toulouse was with the Safari Wire and we always uh, tr managed everything with it because uh, it's more comfortable in terms of uh, ventricle perforation and uh, adaptation inside the, the, the ventricle even when we push the catheter. So I'm really confident with this type of guide wire. In my experience, I don't have experience with the other one. And the, the preformed guide wire is easier maybe, but uh, I would love to Didier, Nicola, and you if you have experience with other type of guide wire because I, I grew up very easily with them. Yeah, so we, we tend to use preformed guide wires for, for everything. It especially helps you when you're pacing on the wire and you need to get a little bit deeper in the ventricle. Uh, and maybe the one situation when it can, uh, when a, uh, for example, a Lunderquist can help you is if you have a horizontal anatomy, if you're having difficulty getting across the, 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 uh, the stenotic valve, then very often using a, a, using a Lunderquist can help you in that situation. Yeah, maybe, um, so uh, maybe one uh, quick additional comment because we we saw the uh, LV wire simulation and just as we are discussing the various type of wires just to let you know that it's uh, easier you conduct easily the uh, the um, the energy to the ventricle with the confida with the safari you need the greater energy and one small trick uh, maybe to scrape a little bit of the coating uh, towards the um, uh, distal end of the wire just to put it to contact the metal surface of the cricketed clamp and the, the inner core of the wire. Easier with the Confida. Safari is our workhorse wire, but you may sometimes scrap the, scratch a little bit of the coating. That's perfect. Thanks, Didier. So we were going to spend a few moments going through some of those key topics, I think, um, at, with relation to TAVI and bicuspid, uh, the first of which being sizing. Um, and, and I suppose to start off, um, with sizing, we, we're, we're still not entirely sure about what is the right way to size bicuspids. And indeed, because we have many different types of bicuspids, maybe one sizing algorithm for all of those valves is, 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 is beyond us. Um, what is important to know is that the reason that bicuspids are somewhat different uh, to tricuspid, it's because of the, the calcium pattern. In tricuspid, the calcium tends to be either in the base of the sinus or at the tips of the leaflet, leaving the center portion uh, of the valve relatively free. On the other hand, uh, in, in, uh, in bicuspids, what you tend to see is that the calcium extends right from the tips of the leaflet through the mid portion of the leaflet and into the base. And so you tend to have much more severe and dense calcification in the middle of the leaflet compared to the tips and the base like you have in tricuspid. And because of that, it, it, when, when sizing a bicuspid, you need to consider the calcium pattern. For traditional tricuspid, of course, we used to size on the annulus. We look at that, it's a reproducible measure. We all know how to do it. But we need to look a little bit further north uh, in bicuspid because if there's severe calcification, if there is a significant fibrotic or calcified raphe, especially if that's a long raphe, well, then that's likely where we're going to be anchoring and sealing, not down at the level of the annulus. And therefore, we need to have some way to try and, uh, to try and size uh, at that level. These are a bunch of bicuspids that I've treated. And as you can see from these, these are all very different types of valves. And so trying to come up with a single algorithm like we do for tricuspid, I just don't think that that's feasible. Therefore, I think it's important that we look not only at the annulus and we take the annulus into consideration, but that we look a little bit above the level of the annulus and see what's the calcification pattern above. Here are, for example, five different uh, types. The top one on your screen on the left-hand side, that's pretty much what we saw today. We saw the calcium at the tips of the leaflet and that very short calcified raphe. Really, annular sizing does for this. On the other hand, you see on the right-hand side at the top of the screen, that very long raffe. That's a really tricky valve to size. On the bottom left, you see that valve that has lots of black in the center. 
these are these are really nasty valves to try and size because these are very thickened and fibrotic leaflets. And when you see this, make sure you do a pre-dilatation. And this is a patient group where a good pre-dilatation with an aortogram, like we saw in today's case, this can really help you. On the other hand, you then see in the middle, you see a, a bicuspid with calcium, not really at, at either side, but on, on the, at the level of the commissure. And then the, the, the fifth one, bottom right-hand side, I really don't know what to do with this valve because this anatomy is so, is so very unusual. What I can tell you is that if we, even if we take one type of bicuspid, we may well get different sizing strategies um, based on where we measure. So if we uh, size on this patient, we see an, a perimeter of 80.9, uh, and this is a 29 Evolute Pro, which would give us about 12.6% oversizing. The same patient, if we then check the intercommissural distance, we see that this intercommissural distance uh, is, is 28 millimeters, 28.7. This would suggest maybe a 34 millimeter Evolute Pro. On the other hand, if we do a super annular like we saw today with DDA, uh, and we do some kind of a spline, trying to consider how that valve is going to be constrained by the calcium, trying to think about what portions of calcium are going to move and what portions of calcium are not going to move, then you need to see that in this, we had down at a 26 Evolute Pro. So really we have three different answers from, from, the, same, uh, from the same valve uh, using three different sizing strategies. So I, I think it's important, I suppose, in each of your cases, to, to try and get a feel for what is the calcium burden? How high is that calcium? Where is the calcium? Tips of the leaflets, uh, base of the leaflets, middle of the leaflet, um, uh, is, it at, is it at the sinus? And then use all of these different types of strategies to try and come up with your sizing strategy. DDA, can I hand over to you? You had a question? It's, uh, do you think that it's the same uh... Uh, we, uh, we should apply the same by, uh, sizing strategy or different sizing strategy to, to make it clearer according to the type of bike speed that we are uh, treating. Uh, and this could be also a question for, for you, Nicolas. For example, do, you, do we size the same way in type 0, type 1, and type 2? Or do you, do you think that there are different uh, strategies that we should apply? It's, it's more an opinion than uh, anything else, Andy, as you guess, and as, as uh, Darren mentioned, because we are still learning on that. Um, my general answer would be that uh, I, I would say no, and I, uh, according to what Darren just described, I would say uh, we try to understand uh, the underlying anatomy, try to anticipate, depending on the type of bike speed, try to anticipate what will be the behavior of a bike speed, and I think, for example, about uh, uh, of a type zero, uh, that are totally different uh, types uh, for sizing by type one, for example. Type one, you, you we described uh, the Bavard algorithm and what we did for that uh, for that example, that works well. I'm quite happy with that. For type zero, I would maybe pay more attention to uh, uh, the supranular sizing, to uh, uh, anticipating of what will be the behavior of the two leaflets. Uh, and maybe use a dynamic uh, assessment with uh, angiography during uh, balloon sizing. Yeah, I think I'd agree with that. I think rather than having hard and fast rules, look at the individual anatomy and try and make decisions. Okay. Uh, so let's move on. Kiara, you're going to talk to us a little bit about available data. Nicholas, about key procedural steps. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just a few words uh, about key procedural steps. I think maybe uh, just worth uh, highlighting and coming back to what is important in bicuspid TAVI procedure, maybe more than in tricuspid TAVI procedure. So we reviewed, we re reviewed that during the case, but I would say maybe pre dilatation of the valve, almost mandatory for all the reasons that were mentioned. Uh, using a balloon sized according to the minimal uh, diameter of the, of the annulus. Uh, second, use the regular technique. And for example, for the uh, Evolute platform, it's not because it's a bike speed that we don't have to use the cusp overlap technique and the cusp overlap view and the commissural alignments. Um, as again, uh, we have to pay maybe a little bit more attention to the accuracy of a placement uh, I would uh, highlight again also the role of the pacing during uh, the deployment of the Evolute platform. 
in order to ensure a good stability and a very accurate placement for the first operator. Really important. Um, I think, Darren, you kept for that part a question that we had initially about post-dilatation. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. important, important to come back to that. Post-dilatation, when are we uh, doing that in biker speed? Main, mainly two reasons. As for over TAVI procedure, because of the amount of paravalvular regurgitation. And what is more uh, uh, specific for biker speed is because we have sometimes seen, a, seen in aerial projection for biker speed type 1 LR, for example, uh, how the frame is underexpanded or it is constrained. And uh, when it is really highly constrained, we can have concerns about the circularity, the uh, consequences it can have on the long-term durability, on the hemodynamic uh, behavior of the valve, the valve area, the gradients, and then we post dilate. And if we post dilate, we choose a balloon that does not exceed the mean uh, annulus diameter on or the uh, minimal intercommensural distance uh, diameter, the, the minimal of the both, uh, according to the sizing. Uh, of course, really accurate uh, high frequency pacing in order to have good stability. And uh, a small trick that we share with DDA is at the time of balloon inflation, a forward movement pressure on the balloon in order to avoid any pop up of the valve and any ascending aorta uh, movement uh, of the valve. And a word of caution uh, all the operators worldwide have been informed by Medtronic about that. If we post dilate in an Evolute platform, we know that we don't have to exceed in terms of diameters. We don't have to exceed uh, the diameter of the frame uh, of the prosthesis because we may uh, and we have a, a risk of uh, damaging uh, the leaflets of the transcatheter valve if we exceed that. So important to integrate also in your sizing, uh, sizing uh, choice of balloon for post dilatation. And my last point, maybe we can go to the next slide. My last point is uh, about the value, and we have we seen that, but the example you have under your eyes is even more striking, the value of uh, repositioning with Evolute in a biker speed. You see in this case example here that is playing uh, around your eyes that the initial position was good reg regarding height, but the amount of regurgitation was not uh, good. Uh, and the constraint was also not good. So we had the choice just to release the valve and uh, to, uh, uh, to pause dilate it, or we had the choice to reposition it, slightly different position, and, uh, and, uh, and just by modifying the position, uh, as you will see on the last slide here, you see that you can end up with a beautiful outcome even in, in very complex anatomy. So it's the thing that we've learned with Evolute Platform. By just repositioning, you, you play a role of a kind of mechanical predilatation of the valve with your first deployments, and you can end up with a beautiful outcome. Nicolas, one quick question from the audience regarding the procedure. Um, what are the advantages to using pacing on the wire compared to a, a balloon tipped catheter like we traditionally did? The advantages of using the left ventricular wire over uh, a temporary RV uh, balloon tipped catheter for pacing, right? Yes, exactly. Yeah, so um, it's not specific to, uh, tri to biker speed setting, of course, but what we have seen is that even numerically low there are some complications related to placement of right ventricular temporary pacing lead. Of course, the small uh, French balloon tip ones are not perforating the right ventricle, but you can have hematomas related to the venous access. You can have complications related to uh, the, the fact that patients cannot work early. And it has been, for those who are interesting, it has been described uh, in the rational and in the publication of an easy TAVI trial that compared these uh, right ventricular pacing modality uh, uh, with uh, uh, left ventricular pacing wire modality. Okay, DDA, quick question for you. Um, uh, one of the participants suggests that uh, when he does uses a 34 millimeter Evolute, uh, maybe a, a, a Lunderquist can give you a little bit more stability. Is something this something that you use in your practice? We spoke briefly about the Lunderquist earlier on. 
what I've learned and what I've seen uh, all around uh, my experience, from my experience worldwide, is that the London grease is mainly used in the US. It's, this is a kind of regular wear for the Evolute. And what we've seen in Europe is that it's not uh, necessary. And honestly, you can, you've seen that through several cases. With the Safari wire or even the Confida, if you apply the proper technique, uh, these devices are quite stable. And if you, uh, you want to be more coaxial, playing on the wire is not really necessary. It's more about uh, rotating a little bit more uh, the catheter and so on. So I would say that I, don't, I personally don't recommend the Lendoquist. It's going to go under, um, against many uh, recommendations for sev from several operators worldwide. But I would say that even in complex situations, uh, it's only if you have extremely tortuous vessels and so on that I would use a Lundoquist. Otherwise, keep it safe for the patient. The regular Confida or Safari wires work and it's safer for your patient. I think that's great advice. Um, quick question, Chiara, again to you uh, before we uh, go on to your, to your discussion about, um, about available evidence. Just in relation to stroke, uh, one of our uh, participants is on from India they don't have the, the Sentinel device available. Um, any other techniques that you use in your center to reduce the risk of stroke during bicuspid TAVI? Uh, we have always used the Sentinel in order to protect uh, both the, um, the carotid and so to prevent the stroke. So I've always used this type of device. Well, the protection that you can do is just to avoid a lot of manipulation inside the calcific uh, annulus and the hortic root. It's something that you can um, foresee, but that you can manage inside your procedure. So stroke is always a mystery of lucky sometimes. Yeah, that's great. So careful manipulation of the catheter coming around the arch. Um, not too many repositions if you can avoid it. Pacing can sometimes help you there. Making sure the ACT is above 300, those kind of things. Okay, so Chiara, in, in terms of where we are at the moment with the evidence for, for TAVI and bicuspid, do we have enough? I mean, uh, do we need more evidence? What, what Can you take us through it? Yeah, of course. Indeed, we moved from uh, early generation device to new generation device. This is the first thing that we have to, to, to evaluate. And uh, since we started with the uh, um, patients undergoing TAVI with the new generation, uh, next slide, please. Yes, since we started with the new generation device uh, obtaining a 5% of mortality at 30 days, but above all, around 30% of more than moderate severe PVL reduced by CT sizing that at the beginning was not um, uh, systematic for all patients. Then we moved to new generation devices and we reduced the PVL rate and above all, we had higher rate success. But we have at the moment some trial and paper and registry looking at bicuspid from different points of view in terms above all of device use the Biolutics. The Biolutics is um, the new study evaluating the um, Evolut uh, Pro and the uh, XL in bicuspid patients, 150 patients. We have uh, already preliminary data showing that we uh, used a lot of repositioning. Pre-dilatation was, was quite mandatory and post-dilatation occurred in uh, the half of patients. So this led to this uh, type of 30-day clinical outcomes, good in terms of mortality, but when we look at the stroke, we have a disabling stroke of 3.3 and a not disabling of 0.7. If we look at all the stroke, we have 4% and uh, at the time of moving to younger patients by cuspid or not by cuspid, we cannot uh, obtain this type of percentage. The same in the heavily low risk by cuspid study, we can see that the composite endpoint of all cause mortality and disabling stroke was 1.3%, and it was similar for the low risk study in tricuspid patient. But again, when we look at the stroke, the disabling was 0.7, we are more lucky, but in the total of the stroke, we are already at 4% again. 
After these two studies uh, regarding the stroke uh, with the use of a self expandable device, here we have uh, a registry reporting in more than uh, 2,000 patients in each group the incidence of mortality and stroke at 30 days and one year in patients undergoing uh, TAVI with the self um, with balloon expandable Sapien 3. And it's a comparison between uh, bicuspid and tricuspid patients. And they found out that uh, in bicuspid patients, the incidence of stroke at 30 days was significantly higher. And uh, this is something that we cannot admit in uh, really young patients undergoing COVID. But without looking at the device used, we can see that it's all about the calcium because you told us that indeed we don't have to look uh, just at the patient with bicuspid valve or with the a fever type bicuspid valve, but we have to look at the morphology of this type of bicuspid. So he defined the three anatomical risks of bicuspid regarding the calcified bracket presence and the excess leaflet calcification. And um, they found out in more than 1,000 patients that indeed uh, the presence of both calcified rafe and the excess leaflet calcification was relied to 25% um, of mortality at two years, two high. And at these two years, they had even more PBL moderate severe incidence and a lot of aortic root injury. So, this is something that we have to consider when deciding to perform a TAV in a bicuspid patient because it's just not a bicuspid. We have to decide it regarding even the anatomical risk, and we can do this looking carefully at the CT and the surgical risk. So we have to work it above all in this particular high risk anatomy. We have to work together with surgeons, and this is be my last message. Yeah, that's that's a great overview of uh, of of where we are with with the evidence in bicuspid, um, and leads us nicely into I think our final discussion uh, regarding whether we need a randomized trial. Um, maybe we might just pause for a moment before we address that particular question, and, and let me I, I suppose say that we've seen today that we can get a beautiful outcome in elderly patients who 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 uh, who, who have uh, bicuspid aortic valve disease. And Medtronic currently have a, a CE mark um, for high risk and intermediate risk patients with, uh, with bicuspid aortic valve disease. So our, uh, we, we, we are, I suppose, able to treat those patients. Um, and we saw that today. But DDA, do we need to go a step further? Do we need to sit down with our, our colleagues in cardiothoracic surgery and plan a, a definitive randomized trial? Because as Chiara has suggested, maybe we have a stroke problem. So it's true, and this is a very important point, and we've seen that through the uh, interest and uh, the enthusiasm uh, surrounding this webinar, because we could see that uh, there was a lot of attendance, because bike speed is really a burning issue. So um, I uh, sent a kind of poll uh, on the social media to understand what was the, the next step in terms of study, and it seems that for uh, almost two, for, uh, uh, two thirds of the, 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 the responses, the uh, participants, we need a randomized trial uh, between surgery and TAVI. So this is a quite strong statement. This is one of the uh, type of information that the, uh, the community is looking for. What is the outcome when we compare surgery to TAVI? I have to say that I, I'm a little bit puzzled with that because I am really, uh, in favor of what uh, Chiara just said, we need to uh, sit together with the surgeon and, and try to undis and understand what is the, the risk, the surgical risk for the patient, and what is also the procedural risk for these bicuspid patients, because we've seen through uh, your beautiful uh, talk, Chiara, that if we combine calcium, excessive calcium, uh, and calcified raffae, the patients are going to be at uh, higher risk of uh, stroke, uh, aortic root injury, injury, and even mortality at two years. So this has an impact. So it leads us to uh, maybe one discussion that we could have, trying to understand, because if we want to run a randomized trial, the patients have to be eligible for both surgery and TAVI. So first question, who is a perfect candidate for this type of study in terms of uh, 
surgical risk profile and at anatomical consideration. And the second step would be who is not a good uh, candidate for therapy. So who would you consider as a perfect candidate that can be randomized uh, between surgery and therapy? I have my idea, but what is yours? Let's start with you, Nicolas. Uh, I, I would start uh, probably by uh, excluding all the patients that are, to my opinion, obvious indication for surgery. And I would say, for example, patients with uh, li significant life expectancy, I mean less than 75, or it depends on the cutoff, that have significant uh, dilation of the ascending aorta, uh, an aut significant autopathy. So typically those, those I would exclude. Yeah, I'd go along those lines as well, Didier. I, I think that, uh, you know, we know TAVI works very well in elderly patients, um, but younger patients, long life expectancy, um, dilated aortic roots, uh, maybe challenging vascular access. Um, I, I think these are patients who, who, who probably do better with surgery. So for me, if I was planning a trial, I'd really want those patients who are, uh, uh, you know, maybe 75 years of age to 80 years of age um, uh, with anatomy that is not prohibitive for, for, for either technique, uh, with um, clinical scenarios that are not prohibitive for either technique. So for example, you don't want very frail patients or renal failure patients going into surgical series. Uh, you need to make sure that there's a level playing field in terms of those, in terms of those issues. But I, I really think that we need this study. We do need to design a study that compares those, those, two, uh, those two treatments. So we see that clearly the, uh, and both of you mentioned the dimension, the dilation of the ascending heart because it makes sense. And also the, um, the age of the patient. So do you think, uh, what is uh, to your opinion, Chiara, the cutoff? What, which cutoff would you consider in terms of age uh, to be randomized in such a trial? Uh, in terms of, um, of uh, sorry, can, can you repeat the question? In terms, in terms of, of, uh, of age, which age would you consider to be uh, included in the trial that randomize, uh, randomizes surgery against TAVI? I think that since we don't have, a, a, we still don't have any results about durability of TAVI, I think that 70, 80 would be the age in order to consider patients for randomized trial. For the aortic dilation, uh, well, we know that orthopathy is the predictor of mortality, so I would not consider this kind of patient. And um, above all, we have to, um, to include, I think, clearly patients that are not so clear defined for surgery or tab in terms even of ejection fraction, comorbidity, and the feasibility of transfemoral tab because we can have lots of TAVI access, but the transfemoral is the one that would maybe be the most comparable in terms of uh, um, easy way to treat a valve compared to surgery. Didier, uh, Chiara mentioned the, the durability question there. Uh, and we saw during uh, uh, the evalve course from PCR recently, uh, eight year data from the Notion 2 trial uh, suggesting that TAVI uh, does uh, exactly the same as, as surgery uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of valve uh, dysfunction, valve failure, and even with better hemodynamics. Yeah. Um, you have a little bit of information for us, DDA, regarding post-implant CT from the Bavard registry. D did you get the feel that from that registry that, that in bicuspid patients, the valves are mal-expanded and therefore we could expect TAVI to have worse durability in bicuspid compared to tricuspid? So this is a crucial um, question. And uh, when we did that uh, work, uh, uh, and Chiara was one of the main, uh, the co-author of this, uh, spa this paper, so you could uh, also uh, provide your input. We could see that the devices are really circular. They are circular, but why were they circular? Because as Nicolas mentioned, uh, there, there was quite of um, uh, a quite aggressive work on these devices with pre-deal and post-deal. Post-deal, keeping it safe without uh, too aggressive balloons, but we can achieve circularity with second generation devices. And potentially this is a surrogate for durability. Because what uh, if we come to the low risk uh, uh, RCT, 
uh, that included, it was led by Ron uh, uh, Waxman, it included different types of devices. There, was sig there were signals towards an increased risk of uh, leaflet thrombosis in bicuspid speed uh, patients. So probably the stent frames were not expanded properly. The valves were too big as compared to the anatomy of the patient and so on. So I do believe that we, there is still um, progress to be made in terms of sizing, appropriate sizing for various platforms and uh, how to make sure that we obtain circularity for this, uh, these patients before randomizing everyone. We need to, to do a little bit of work in the transcatheter arm be, to be really competitive uh, um, in regards to surgery as compared to surgery. Chiara, would you, would you yeah, agree? Yeah, I totally agree. And I will just add that we, in the Bavard, we found out that sometimes it's real that the device is circular, but it's 10, 15% of overexpansion of the device. So this is the real question that we pose to ourselves in terms of durability. And uh, we can see it by following up these patients, but uh, it's true that we have to define our type of sizing before uh, any type of randomized. That's true, we've got more to learn. Nicolas, maybe one final question for you before we wrap up from, from uh, one of our colleagues. Um, they want to know, in, in, maybe in younger patients who have already had the aortic root replaced due to aortic root dilatation, but who have not had the aortic valve replaced, in those situations, can, can Tavi provide a solution to a second surgery? Uh, or are these, are these too difficult to do for us? No, I, I don't think so. And it's a, typically a good subset of patients where it might be worth uh, thinking about a transcatheter solution because, because re, redo, redo surgery here uh, could be really, really high risk, uh, uh, especially if on top of uh, articroot replacements, you had a reimplantation re of a coronary arteries or bypass grafts uh, on top of that. Uh, it adds some challenges. Again, uh, a story of a particular case, particular analysis of the CT scan of the anatomy. What I can share is some experience on that and uh, where you can discover some, some unexpected events or complications. For example, uh, uh, the outflow portion of, a, of an evolute frame uh, that was pushed after final release by the kinking and the rigidity of the angulation between the ascending aorta tube and the residual native uh, Valsalva sinus. So a very, very specific subset of anatomy, but of course, uh, generally speaking, wise to, and uh, interesting to consider Tavi in, in this uh, subset. Excellent. So listen, I think with that, we, we've gone over time a little bit, but uh, I think it was a really fantastic session. Uh, I, I've certainly really enjoyed it and, and learned a lot from it, so, so thank you. Um, I'd like to thank PCR for, for hosting us and Medtronic for sponsoring this event. Um, I'd like to thank a, a brilliant faculty, Chiara, Didier and Nicola. Uh, thank you for your insights, uh, uh, for all of your work in this bicuspid field. Uh, and guys, thanks for a brilliant case. Um, I, I'd especially like to thank the participants for their questions and for engaging with us uh, and, and helping us uh, address some of those important uh, issues. Um, and I think the key learnings are that we can treat patients with bicuspid aortic valve disease, um, that we can get very beautiful results like we just saw. Um, that in this particular case, the Evolute platform um, gave us great hemodynamics, gave us no paravalvar leak. Um, but we do require careful sizing uh, and, and very careful procedural performance on a case-by-case -case basis. Every bicuspid is different. We need to consider that when we're doing a case that it may be a little bit different to, to tricuspid. And finally, I think the key, key, key point is that when you are faced with a bicuspid, have a look at the patient, have a look at the, 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 the patient's anatomy and bring it to your heart team. Discuss it with your surgeon. Maybe this is a very tough TAVI case, but a very easy surgical case. On the other hand, maybe it's a challenging surgical case, but a simple TAVI case. So I would encourage you all to bring these cases to your heart team and have a full, open and frank discussion about what the best thing for your patient is. And with that, I'm going to leave you. I know that we have some more um, uh, uh, TAVI webinars coming up on PCR. There's some great topics in terms of coronary protection, valve in valve, durability of transcatheter heart valves. So please uh, stay tuned to, to PCR online. 
uh, for those uh, for those forthcoming events. Thanks for joining us today. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.